So, I know geography doesn't get uh, terribly too much respect, but I'm going to assume that you can all tell me what planet this is. Um, however, and I don't think I'm being presumptuous when I say that, probably none of us, and I mean us, I include myself in this, have any idea what's actually going on here. It is a ridiculously complex system. We are lucky if we can get a general sense of the trends of long-term activities of the entire planet, let alone the complex interactions going, in, going on on small scales. Richard Dawkins once said that physics is the study of simple things. Biology is the study of complex things. And I'm sorry, physicists, but you tend to study an electron. Biologists have to study trillions of electrons and how they interact with each other and their protons and their neutrons and every now and then gamma rays and other things that might interfere. Michael Faraday, the great physicist, was once asked, what is the use of science? And he's said to have replied, what is the use of a newborn baby? Richard Dawkins interprets this as meaning that science grows up. And with the complexity of the world, we've seen that science has been growing up for the past 3,000 years. It's only been in the past 150 years that we've noticed how intricately linked we are with nature, let alone our own cultures. But within the past few decades, we have seen, through a variety of organizations and people and fields, popping up these ideas that started to converge. And we had ethnobiology, and ecological anthropology, and cultural ecology, and they all sort of pointed towards a common idea. The idea of biocultural diversity. The idea that the diversity of life entails biological, cultural, and linguistic diversity. Well, we can debate how closely related language is with culture. Uh, I'll bring you an anthropologist, and you bring me Noam Chomsky, and they can have at it. But uh, it's important. We can, we can agree it's important. It's Even the United Nations Environment Program said in their Global Environment Outlook in 2007 that biodiversity also incorporates human cultural diversity. Now, we can't take these two apart. In fact, there's an inexorable link. And the notion of this inexorable link implies not only that biological and cultural diversity are linked to a wide range of human nature interactions, but also that they are co-evolved, independent, and mutually reinforcing. These are all very, very key. Co-evolved, interdependent, mutually reinforcing. So, what do we already know? Well, after our 3,000 years of growing up with science, we seem to have established that biodiversity is significant for ecological stability. We've got quite a lot of evidence that cultural diversity gives us a very broad knowledge base from which to work with. Well, biocultural diversity, of course, can only be better, can't it? It gives us such things as traditional ecological knowledge, or tech. I like that acronym, tech. And what we can use that for is we can harness our broad knowledge bases that have co-evolved with a given ecosystem, and use that to preserve the biodiversity, which is essential for the stability, which is essential for us to continue evolving with the system, and so on, and so on. It works. We've seen it. Don't believe me? This is what the knowledge of biocultural diversity can be used for. It can be used to protect endangered species. Indigenous tribes, deep in the heart of the Amazon, they know how many animals of a certain type are there, and how to harvest them sustainably. They've been doing it for a long time. And it's been shown to work in Namibia with traditional game management. Growing crops with sustainable yields. There's a lot of controversy over the Green Revolution about what it's done by dumping all these uh, pesticides and herbicides and extra fertilizers all over our soils. But the worst part is, we, part of the reason we've done this is because we've gone into areas cleared away the original crops, and planted in ones from entirely different continents. Of course that wasn't going to work. Traditional ecological knowledge, the traditional crops. What can grow there? What evolves to grow there? Spreading education. You can't educate people unless you know how best they learn, what they want to learn. You can't just plop a school down and assume that people will learn. Eradicating disease. 
providing medicines in a tropical rainforest, establishing trade routes and infrastructure without blocking a caravan's route to its well in Sahara, protecting diversity entails understanding biocultural diversity. This is Quechua, the region in Ecuador. Many of the people there still speak um, indigenous languages unrelated to Spanish. Unfortunately, many of them have forgotten uh, which are the traditional crops they have grown, but uh, many of them still remember, and they're trying to respread this knowledge. It's a very good site for understanding biocultural diversity, not just because of these tribes that still have a lot of their traditions, and we can clearly study how they interact with their environment and how this is better or worse than anything Westerners have brought in. But a student from Yakut University has actually been here and worked with them on this very topic. And then she came back, and we were discussing all the implications, and we had an idea. Workshops. So, biocultural diversity is important. Okay. How important? Well, people need to be told about it. So just tell them? No, of course not. You can't just tell them. What have I just been saying? It's about culture. It's about understanding. It's about so much diversity that every single person is different. Every different background produces an entirely unique individual. We have to get them talking to each other, not just being talked at. So this is the idea of BCDC, Biocultural Diversity for Conservation, or Biocultural Diversity and Conservation, or Biocultural Diversity with Conservation. I haven't really decided what's a good preposition in there. In fact, I'm thinking I might insert one of those logical operators, Biocultural Diversity if and only if Conservation. Because conservation entails biocultural diversity in the sense of mathematical logic. But that's a whole other that's a whole other discipline which we can integrate into BCDC, but um, stay away from there. The idea is this. We get students from this diverse background we have to choose from here at Athens University. From all over the world, from all different schools and education backgrounds, with all different desires and ambitions. Some of them want to be economists, some of them want to be physicists. Some of them want to be hippies and chain themselves up to rainforests to protect them from logging. <laughs> and we get them together, and we have them do research on case studies that incorporate all these different ideas. Ecotourism in Costa Rica, traditional game management in Namibia, water preservation in South Africa through traditional means. We have them discuss them from all their different perspectives, and we have them focus on real problems and try and think of their own possible ideas and solutions, both on the small scale, finding a particular village in Namibia with a particular problem and saying, what would you do about this? Who would you talk to? Who do you think could help it? But also the global issues. Get them thinking about these, because the idea is that after this workshop, they don't stop. Everything they do in their lives is going to affect everyone else's life. So they might as well be thinking about it all the time. And this is not trivial, games and movies, because Movies are culture, and culture can spread ideas very powerfully. So can these games. Here's a picture of the uh, pilot workshop that we held just this past spring. Us sitting outside, and some genius decided to turn the tables into chairs. It was very comfy. But these games, every person that came got a welcome packet with the case studies and the information and the schedule and all that standard stuff. But they also had a picture of a particular animal. And they had to first group themselves together with someone else who they thought their animal was somehow closely related to, for whatever reason. Maybe they lived in the same habitat. Maybe they were under the same similar uh, broad range of threat like habitat loss or deforestation. It was entirely up to them how they grouped themselves by similarity. And it was very fascinating to see what ex explanations they had to come up with. And then to have themselves group themselves up by difference. And once they were grouped up by difference, and say, well, I really think this jellyfish has absolutely nothing to do with this lizard. Okay, well then how are they similar? And could we do without one of them? And then for the rest of the workshop, they would have to be thinking about their animal with respect to whatever we were talking about. No matter how entirely detached it seemed to be talking about the deserts in Namibia and thinking about a jellyfish, the idea was to try and get them to see these connections. Because even the jellyfish are important to their ecosystems. And their ecosystems interact with their neighboring ecosystems. And Namibia is a coastal country. And jellyfish are in the ocean. So there will be interaction. But of course, this doesn't seem enough, does it? 
Idea number two, lots of workshops. And this is not trivial, because we're not just talking about holding this workshop over and over and over again. We are talking about going out and bringing this workshop to people all over the world through many different ways. One is simply to just have these presentations that we use in the workshop as templates and let anybody use them. Another is people who have run the workshop before will go out. We can send the person who's been to Quechua back to Quechua, back to Ecuador, and she can bring these discussions to them and get them interacting with it. Or perhaps we go to London, we get some corporate executives, and we get them talking about their corporation's impacts on the global world and how they should be incorporating biocultural diversity. Or even better, get them together. Get some villagers near Manaus together with the local governments of Brazil and have them actually talking to each other within the framework of this workshop. We'll give them project outlines and we'll prepare workshops to their interests if they are businessmen or chemists or just local villages. It doesn't matter. As long as they fall within the, the, the guidelines, we'll give them our general support. This is what it would look like. We could take this anywhere. We could have it outside, we could have it in a room, we could have slides, we could have the old school slides that you have to project up through a light. Oh, that's classic, I love that. But of course, none of this is worth anything without community. Idea number three. And it's the best time in the past 3,000 years to build global community. Now, apparently not. Because technology is now failing me. Ah, here we go. Let's publish these discussions. Every discussion we have, whatever results we have, whatever people want to talk about, put it up there. Continuously update these case studies. The world is changing day to day, and there's no way we've got all the information by today anyway. So we have to constantly update them. Let's create forums on a single website where people can log in and talk about anything. The broader ontological issues or the specific real world problems and create free public domain media, animations, videos, audio recordings, whatever. Put it up there. Anything that helps transmit these ideas, be it through fiction and culture, or be it through simple teaching, like with the, with the case studies. And we already have a simple website with an ugly URL, bcdcworkshops.wordpress.com. Uh, we're hoping to upgrade, obviously, but service space costs money. We're working on that. But the important thing is that we're going to give it a shot. Because even here in Germany, no matter how fancy we think our Western civilization may be, none of us live in a box. Well, you could say we live in a box. But this is the box. Light comes in, radio waves go out, and that's about it. Everything else is us bouncing around a series of chemicals scattered about this tiny little planet, constantly interacting with each other. And we may never fully understand the planet, which we should at least try to understand each other. Thank you.